You are very welcome along to the Keith Andrews Show. We've got a busy show for you today. We're going to be over to Cheltenham to join John Duggan, Gallivant and Kevin Kamban. We'll talk to James Downey about the Six Nations on Saturday, Ireland versus England. We've got my old international teammate, Alan Judge, club teammate, I should say, not international. He's hoping to add to his international caps, and you'll hear a little bit of that later on. Um, as always, you can watch the show on YouTube, Twitter, and Facebook. And the guest ticket today has gone to the hottest tipster in the building by all accounts for Cheltenham. I don't know True. by I don't know by what account this is. Maybe my own account, you know, <laughs> blowing my own trumpet there a little bit earlier on. So I, I had this kind of top class technique of how to do betting good. And yeah. that was basically take our betting expert, John Duggan, yeah. write down his tips and then take out the Irish Examiner and see what Ruby Walsh is tipping in there. And if they match. And if they match, go for it. The first two di- on the first day, they uh, both gave an each way bet. They both won. Yesterday, they crossed over on one bet on an each way bet and that placed. So today, I was very excited. I was like, got all John Duggan's tips, opened up the Irish Examiner completely different set of tips <laughs> so unfortunately I'm not Ireland's hottest tipster today where do you go with that then today well uh, see what John has to say uh, yeah exactly see my, what John has to say also Michael Verney in the Irish Independent is having an extremely hot week he mm-hmm. is on fire at the moment so I've taken uh, a, a tip from him in, in Maldini in the 530 now Patrick Mullins uh, seems to be pretty hot hot is the, the adjective right now yeah. on Bacardi's in the in the 330 also an each way bet I'm not a fan of the each way bet you You're know it's fun no, I am. Oh, right, yeah. Because I'm not a big better. I, I like that kind of safety blanket. You know, I don't Lee like. Lee Westwood was on yesterday. I don't know if you've seen him. They grabbed him in after the. How many races in a day at Cheltenham? Is it six? Seven. Seven? Yeah. Oh, was it? Okay. Well, he'd had eight winners in a row. He won every race in Cheltenham on the Tuesday. They grabbed him in after the first race on the Wednesday in for a little. You know, and the, the, their coverage, they have a, like a little desk with all the, the online sh- the social, social media. social stable. Yeah, that's the one. And um, he had eight winners in a row at Cheltenham. I think he was up about 25 grand. Lee Westwood. Lee Westwood, who, by the way, his gear was nothing short of disgusting. <laughs> he had a matching rascal tweedy cap with a jacket, but it was loud. It was very, very loud. Eight, cr- eight winners in a row That is Cheltenham. absolutely yeah. insane. How have I not heard about this? Yeah. Lee Westwood. Check it out. We need to get him on the show. Yeah, let's get him. Tommy, get, can we get Lee Westwood on, please? Uh, before we move on to Champions League football, uh, how was your little trip to New York? Because myself and Tommy were here holding the fort. Yeah. Um, you know, the solid citizens of off the ball, and you were off gallivanting in New York with the lads. Yeah, I heard you improved the fort, actually. That, that's what <laughs> I heard. <laughs> I don't know about that. I heard, I heard a sponsor. How was the trip, all right? Very good, yeah, very good. A big uh, shout out to Floyd's of Brooklyn, the greatest pub I've ever been in, because Why? inside in this place they had a bocce court. Are you familiar with uh, no. what bocce is? Part of my ignorance. It's uh, essentially bowls. Let's just say it's bowls. So you walk into a, a pub. You're and, not capturing me here. And there's like a little sand track down the back of the pub. Like, what the hell is going on here? And there's really competitive people playing bocce. We get involved. I was told to feck off because I was yeah, so bad good? at it. No. But Adrian Barry was the king of bocce. I'm sure he'll be able to tell you himself when he's got to go. <laughs> he played it before, weeks. obviously. He probably has, yeah. It's probably a big thing in Westmead. Certainly, <laughs> where I'm from, I've never heard of bocce before. I had to Google it. Where, but where you are from, Gaelic football is a big... Oh, yeah. I, there, there was definitely no Gaelic football. Last weekend, no? I, I, I have no, no idea what game you're talking about. It's uh, Super dubs again. Super dubs. Well, really, yeah. I, I, I must strolled t- the victory. I might Google I that. Avert. I might Google that. I no, I don't, I, I'm not interested in talking about that sort of thing. <laughs> right, come on, we'll move on to Champions League. Yeah. We'll start with Man United, um, go out to Sevilla. Again, a disappointing performance result, obviously. After the first leg, and we, he got a lot of criticism, the away leg, nil-nil. After that, domestically, good couple of comebacks against Chelsea, against Crystal Palace, obviously the victory over Liverpool uh, on Saturday. And then... The manner of this defeat, the performance levels, the energy levels, the team selection. I'm struggling to think of what was right with that game from yeah. the Man United point of view. It was so wrong. And again, he's getting criticised heavily in a lot of quarters. Uh, not too long after signing a new contract, by the way. It's, um, it's not a good time there, is it? It's absolutely appalling. The worrying thing about it is that you go back a few weeks and you go back to the first leg of the Sevilla game Mm. and you think to yourself, right, this is clearly a systemic failure here. Jose Mourinho's tactics aren't working. He clearly hasn't gone for it. And these really talented players are suffering as a result. But what was very worrying about the second leg was that the players have clearly lost all their ability as well. I mean, that Paul Pogba pass straight out of play kind of summed up the entire thing. Alexis Sanchez seems to have lost whatever mm. talent he did have at the start of the season. And it seems that he, 
it kind of proves the theory that he was really angling for that move away from Arsenal when he was scoring a couple of goals. Mm. His performance level seemed to have regressed a little bit again. Lukaku looked brilliant on Saturday. It was yeah. like, finally, this guy has arrived yeah. as a target man in the Premier League and was little to, it was pretty much close to ineffectual against Sevilla in the second Let's, leg. We'll get stuck into certain key players and I want to come back to Pog, but certainly want to talk to, about Fellaini in terms of team. Mm. But let's have a, li- a little listen to what Jose Mourinho had to say after the game. We have no time to be to be sad for more than 24 hours, and that's that's football. That's not the end of the world. Uh, I sit in this chair uh, twice in the Champions League, and I knock out Man United at home at Old Trafford. I sit in this chair with Porto, Man United out. I sit in this chair with Real Madrid, Man United out. So I don't think is is something new for the for the club, and uh, of course, being Manchester United manager and uh, losing um, a Champions League tie at home is 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 a delusion, obviously. Well, clearly not happy. Something in me just it makes me feel that he had that ready to say if it didn't go to plan. I think it's nonsense. For a start, you, you're saying you agree with completely that? Completely agree. And we haven't actually t- chatted about this before he came on. Completely agree he had that ready to say before he went on air. I feel it's a subliminal message yeah. when he says, this is nothing new for United. Mm. Like, that says to me that he's saying to the board, this is our standard. So I'll tell you what else is, is, is nothing new for United. The way they're playing now mm. is, it's just, it's boring. When you get the results, you get away with it. When you don't get the results, like the other night, so let, let's get stuck into it. Okay, team selection from the Saturday. One of the big talking points. Fellaini starts, not match fit. Clearly you could see that. I am not his biggest fan. I, I have rowed to Kenny Cunningham on numerous occasions about Fellaini, mainly on their Europa League uh, quest last season where he was effective, and I agree he is effective. He's not a Man United player. For me, he is not a Man United. He's not good enough to be a Man United player. When you play him, the reason I think he played him um, centre midfield alongside Matic last night was because he felt they would be stronger defensively. Nothing could be further from the truth. His awareness and his defensive instinct just isn't there. And even at a younger age, I think McTominay is actually more astute in terms of defensively orientated, his awareness around him, players rolling off the back of him. It was a strange call by Mourinho to, to start him last night. Yeah, completely. I think when you come to that positional awareness, you've got Fellaini and Pogba at the bottom rung, St- Scott McTominay a little bit above them, and Matic is obviously their best player mm. uh, in that position and clearly isn't shooting the lights out either, except for that wonder goal against Crystal Palace. And what was odd about it is that you looked at the team sheets before the game and before we knew that they were going to choke as bad as they did. And you start to think to yourself, wait, Benega and, um, and Nzonzi. Yeah. They're pretty much a better holding midfield duo than Fellaini and Matic, mm. even before we get into the whole underperforming element of things. Yeah. So when you're coming up against a side where the fifth best in Spain and they've got a better centre mid partnership than you, you're in big trouble, especially yeah. if you're Manchester United. Especially with the money they've spent. Yeah. And even today, we're looking at the back of the papers. Oh, he, he's linked with Willian. He wants to sign Willian. You've just signed Sanchez. You're not getting the best out of him. You get the best out of Rashford playing from the left on, on Saturday against Liverpool. Keep him on the left. For the time being, keep him on the left. Eventually, he will end up as a centre forward. But for the time being, leave him there. He tweaks that to get Sanchez on the left. He simply isn't getting the best out of a very good squad of players. There's no doubt about that. And you've mentioned Pogba. Pogba coming on, he looks gone. He looks so short of confidence. You spoke about the stray ball. Mentally, he's not right. For whatever reason, he simply isn't right. Whether it's the relationship between him and Mourinho, Sanchez coming in on bigger money, throwing his, throwing his toys out of the pram, we don't know. I'm sick of hearing he needs to play in, in a three-man midfield. The left of a three. I'm sick of it, yeah. I, I, I'm done with it. I really am. Because he's, he's, is he 24, 25 now? Maybe yeah. 25. Just play as a centre midfielder. Shut up about this three-man midfield from the left. Nonsense. Yeah, it's interesting that you mentioned that we don't know what's going on between himself and Mourinho. I thought it was very pointed in the BBC interview on yeah, Saturday. Yeah, when he joined in. When he comes over yeah. to Mourinho yeah. and it seems like he's playing up to Jose Mourinho mm. as if 
like, uh, is there has there been a conversation there where Josie's like, you got to prove yourself to me, and yeah. uh, Pog was like the nerd at the front of class, almost trying to suck up to the teacher. Yeah. Is that uh, is that the it sort was. of relationship that that's going on there? Because we yeah, don't it know. It, it it is very strange. Like the Marcus Rashford one is a very interesting one as well. I mean, is he starting to look in the mirror and is thinking? When I'm 23, 24, am I going to be as good as I could have been at that age mm. when I started even under Louis van Hal? Like, imagine how good Marcus Rashford could be already if he was under Alex Ferguson. Mm. Frank de Boer was completely bang on the money about uh, Marcus Rashford. I he think. was, spot on. And in terms of like him under Mourinho and the way Mourinho sets up a team and his development, you would liken it to maybe Arsenal young players coming through. They show that promise, they show that potential, and then it plateaus. Mm. And I'm not saying that's happening with Rashford, but I think if Mourinho was in charge for the next two, three, four years, do you think he would really go to that next level? Because he's got, he's got everything with, to be able to go to that next level. His size, speed, his awareness, his attitude seems spot on. It's, it's a tricky, tricky little path. I just want to read out a comment we've had in from Jack O'Shea Khan. Feel massively for Lukaku. We got the ball about five times and made something of it four times. Couldn't get the ball into him. You mentioned he played better against Liverpool. On Saturday, it's he needs to start playing at that level against the big teams more consistently. I feel the criticism on him at times this season has been a little bit unfair in terms of his build-up play, his hold-up play. I personally think it's got better this season. Mm, yeah, there's also the element of isolation in the Jose Mourinho mm. system, and you do need to be an excellent target man. Like you could also counter that by saying who was marking him on Saturday and the disaster that he has been yeah. all season for Liverpool. So uh, I, I do think it was an exceptional performance from a target man perspective, mm. which was the first time I feel that we've seen that really from Manchester United. Like he's obviously banged in a few goals, particularly in the first couple of months of the season. But this was the first time where he's getting up high for the ball, knocking it onto Marcus Rashford, mm. and that's when United using that strength. Yeah, they were really at their best and. It certainly got me rethinking the theory that Liverpool are best primed to challenge Manchester City next season. But then Tuesday night happens and you're back to square one again. Yeah. You're like, Manchester United are going backwards. And it's, it's very, very hard to tell what Mourinho is thinking right now. What is that message he was trying to send out on Tuesday night when he says that this is our level now? This has happened to Manchester United before. This is just like the Alex Ferguson era. But it's not. It's a lot worse, Jose. And I, I, I don't know what he's hoping for because mm. like, at least when it comes to Chelsea... You can at least say, well, they haven't exactly put in the spending power of the likes of Manchester mm. City or United. United, though. No I'm getting excuse. a bit sick of his nonsense at this stage on. I really am. It's just like it, it's one thing after another, throwing his toys out of the pram. He'd done that to get Sanchez in in January, where he was saying, we can't compete with Manchester City. And that, you know, the new contract, all that. But look, we, we'll come back to a bit of Champions League and a bit, a bit of football there. But we had AP McCoy on the show last week. Oh, and you went here, you were in New York. Um, so let's hear what he had to say on the stairs hurdle. Uh, I, I'm not sure. Um, I know the five year old, uh, the horse, he's six now, he's Sam Spinner, was very impressive when the Lomok heard when he was five at Ascot, beat Lammy Surge. And, you know, I mean, Harry, Yamworth beat Super Sunday at Aintree um, over three miles. I actually think Yamworth could beat Super Sunday again. Do I think Yamworth will win the stairs hurdle? Not sure. You know, so very, very open race. If you were going to pick one? Um, if I was going to pick one, I'd. Oh, no, I'm not. I'd probably Sam Spinner. I'd probably, you know, I think maybe him. Joining us on the line is John Duggan from Cheltenham. John, thanks for joining us. Keith and Owen, how are you doing? Are we making money? Uh, Owen is. Apparently, Owen's got a formula which involves you uh, and your tips, cross examining it with some of the key newspapers, seeing what the common denominator is, and he's quids in, John. Detective Owen Sheehan. Telling you, he's bang on it. <laughs> to reveal your uh, formula. Well, it's it's very high tech, John. I'm not sure if, if, I, if it's capable of explaining this uh, over this medium when you're not here in studio. But basically, I take your tips and I see if Ruby Wall just tipped them as well. Today, that hasn't <laughs> happened, unfortunately. <laughs> How's it been going over there, John? And Keith, are you are you, are you getting involved, Keith, at all? Are you, are you having a you having a flutter at all yourself? I I tell you what, I did yesterday. I got a couple of little tips. Um, I think they stemmed from in and around the office. Tommy's laughing through the window here because the first one I did was a disaster. I can't even remember the name. Dudikov, is it? Dudikov? Uh, Tiger Roll. Uh, no, I didn't have Tiger Roll. Um, I wasn't on that. So, yeah, I have been. I was on the sofa all afternoon yesterday. Really, really enjoyed it. Um, I've been on many a time. Fortunately, I can't get there this week, but it, it's an electric atmosphere. I know you love it over there, John, don't you? Yeah, 17th year, Keith. Uh, so, I'm a glutton for punishment, but there is no other race like Cheltenham, as you know, and it's just, 
it's, it's just very hard to describe until you've been here. And once you've been here, you understand what it is about. It's just bigger and better than everything. And it's like any big sporting event. It just has that aura that other sporting events don't. So um, there's been a lot of rain over the night, nine millimeters. It's going to be very testing for the horses, the jockeys and the trainers and the punters in different ways. Um, so we're looking forward to a half one start here and to increase the tally of Irish winners. Nine on the board at halfway is really impressive. Uh, we've got to touch on Ruby Walsh yesterday. We heard AP speak about him last week in terms of his road to recovery. That was just cruel what happened to him yesterday, wasn't it? It was awful, Keith. It's just, it's, this is a game, uh, to be very brutal about it, where people have lost their lives. It's, very, it's a very dangerous sport. and you, you, I don't know of another sport where an ambulance follows the participants all around uh, during, this, during the, the action. It's, uh, Ruby Walsh, is, he's, he's made of iron, as we know, as all these jockeys are. But she, at 38 years of age, he broke his leg in November. He's four months out. He does everything he can in his power to come back to ride at Cheltenham because this is what they live for. He rides two brilliant winners on Tuesday, and then and then this happens. And it's just very, very unfortunate. And um, we wish him a speedy recovery and hope he's back for Punchestown. Yeah, we, it's, it's, just, it's just not fair. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, Gordon Elliott had a good day yesterday. Three winners. Are you anticipating anything similar today for him or it'll be a little bit tougher maybe today? Well, Shattered Love, Keith, has been backed in the first race. That's the JLT and Officers Chase. Shattered Love, she's a mare. She will love the ground. She loves bottomless ground. So she's been backed uh, for Gordon into 11 to 2. Um, he's got Glen Lowe in this uh, pretense handicap hurdle, also for money, 5 to 1 favourite in the colours of JB McManus. So there's a couple there from Gordon already that have chances. I think Willie will always throw a few as well. He's had five winners so far, so we know that the, the yard is flying. And he's got Undeso, the favourite in the Ryanair chase, backed into 11 to 8 on now with Duvan and non runner. Paul Townend will now ride under so in the absence of Ruby Walsh. Um, just a couple of other pieces of information. Patrick Mullins rides Bacardi's in the stairs hurdle. That's the feature race of the day at half three. Robbie Power is now on Salsa Resha in the mare's hurdle. And Paul Townend has been confirmed to ride Kilolta Vic in the Gold Cup tomorrow. Um, it's an each way day, guys. It's a lot of big fields, a lot of plots, a lot of, lot of, lot of, lot of uncertainty with the ground. How is this ground going to ride? And um, that, that, that causes uncertainty in terms of predicting what's going to happen. Uh, John, for those people who had kind of today's card marked out before today and had banked on Ruby Walsh riding, do you think that uh, the change to Paul Town and then a couple of horses into a couple of other jockeys, does that really make any marked difference for people who already had their card marked? Um, well, I would say the jockeys are very good. That's the first thing. Paul Townend is, a, is a, an accomplished jockey, and he's won around Cheltenham. Uh, Robbie Power, who rides the mare, uh, is an accomplished jockey, a Gold Cup winning jockey. And Patrick Mullins knows Bacardi is inside out. So I don't think there's any real worry about the ability. It's just the knowledge of the horse. And I think if there's one horse that Ruby Walsh knows and understands how to ride, it is under so in that Ryanair chase. The horse just goes off at 100 miles an hour. It's hold on tight. It's make sure it's like one of those booking Broncos. Make sure you don't fall off. Um, and Ruby managed to get through to the end last year without falling off. And he was a brilliantly impressive winner. The ground is softer this time. So what they don't want with under so is for the horse to be too keen and to go off like a mad thing and then blow his chance. So That'll be the only concern out of the ones I've seen in terms of the in terms of the changes. But Paul Townend knows, knows what he's doing more than you, uh, Owen, I, or Keith. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think he knows a tad more than I do anyway, that's for sure. Uh, when it comes to that race, like, would it be fair to say that Q card would bring the house down, that it will get the biggest Cheltenham roar of the week? Uh, should it beat on the show? Yeah, I think it would until Mike Bite wins the Gold Cup tomorrow. That will probably get a big, even bigger roar. But yeah, Q card is, I mean, everybody wants to latch on, latch on to a favourite, a horse that um, we all love. We loved Anoli here, we loved Isterback, we loved Hardy Eustace, we loved even Fleming Star in the last couple of years in Ireland and we like a people's horse and that we can attach to and actually own as it were, in adversary commas, and Q card is one of those. He's been a brilliant horse, he's won uh, the, the the race at the festival before. He like he started off as a four-year-old winning a bumper here. Of course, he won the King George Chase, which is one of the best chases. Never won a Gold Cup, has fallen a couple of times in the Gold Cup but um, maybe that makes him more um, people more sympathetic towards him. He's not a machine. He's human. Uh, well, he's obviously not human, but uh, you know, in, in terms of equine, t- <laughs> in terms of equine terms, you get what I'm saying. You know, he's he's got he's got frailties and weaknesses like a, like us all. So um, yeah, he's he's getting on now. He's 12, but uh, you know, he's he does retain ability and he ran well at Ascot last time. John, just finally, I know you um, do a, your charity bet. You take a lot of pride in that. How's it going? Give us the update on how that's going. Uh, well, we have spent a thousand so far, Keith, and we have 1376, so we're up about 376 euro. Um, Snow Falcons actually a non-runner in the first. That was one of the bets. The ones that have gone for today, Bacardi's each way, 
uh, a 10 to 1 in the stairs hurdle and there's another one called final nudge in the last race will love the ground third in the welsh national about 16 to 1 this morning has been backed and i think he might be in worth each way uh, selection as well but the tips run off the ball.com john we wish you the best with that and enjoy the rest of the festival thanks for joining us so you've been I'm over, jealous. Yeah, I was going to say you've you've obviously sampled this before, so you know exactly what you're missing. Yeah, I've I've been there a good few times. Whenever I've been at clubs in and around it, probably not even in and around there. I remember coming from Blackburn after training to get down. I think we missed the first two three races. Straight in off the training pitch, shower into a car down two or three of us. Uh, night in in Cheltenham, the atmosphere is electric. Like John is there for very different reasons. John loves mm. horse racing. I have to be honest, yesterday was one of the first days. I actually really enjoyed sitting on the sofa and watching a bit of the racing yesterday. But it's I have day, been yeah. a few times. Um, if I ever bring out a book, which I never, ever will, there might be a couple of chapters on, on Cheltenham because it's just <laughs> an amazing place. So I'll give you one little story. I've told you this anyway. Uh, we were there one year and a friend of mine, who will remain nameless, came back. We were in a, in a box with a team. I can't remember what team we were at at the moment. Because I played on uh, two clubs. Anyway, doesn't matter. You come back from the toilet, panting, out of breath, screaming at the lads, lads, lads. And he, we thought there was something obviously up with him or he said something where he said, lads, we need to hold the RSPCA. There's someone out there whipping a horse. <laughs> He's basically implying he didn't even know there was horse racing going on. That's, so that, that's almost like an anomaly for Cheltenham. I mean, it's mm. something that you'd hear in entry or something like that. But Cheltenham, they always say, well... It's a very knowledgeable crowd. You know, you don't always get that at like yeah. the World Cup or at All Ireland finals. But at Cheltenham, the pinnacle of the sport has the pinnacle of the fans. Yeah, I thought. Well, it certainly wasn't always the case when <laughs> when I went. Anyway, um, but we're going back next year. We're in the show from there next year, aren't we, Tommy? Yeah, we are. That's the plan. Yeah, well, I'll hold down the fort yeah. while you're away that time. You, you know? You've never been then. Never been to Cheltenham, no. I, I have been advised, and I, I'm not sure is it my my friends who know a little bit more about racing than mm. I do, patronising me. But they say I oh, probably prefer entry, which says no. to me, you know, you prefer the the crack no of no the No comparison. Uh, no I would, comparison. Like, I want to hear the Cheltenham roar in real life. Yeah. Like, that's one of those sporting bucket list things. So, absolutely, I want to go. I don't want to go and, you know, have all that charity money kind of uh, and, all that, and all that pressure on me yeah. like John Duggan is. Yeah. I'd, I'd rather go as a punter, you know, or, you know, we could do the Keith Andrews show from there. And I, 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 I think, think that's the one. You want the golden ticket for that, don't yeah, you? Yeah, I, I looked at the golden ticket schedule. I think I, I happened to be on the golden tickets around uh, Paddy's week. Middle of March next yeah, yeah. 2019. So, you know, I'll just, I'll just do the good thing and I'll go over and we'll do stairs day uh, that day. Well, speaking of punters, we've, I think we've, we're trying to get Kevin Kilvan on the line. Kev, are you there? We got him. Hi, lads. How are you, buddy? Oh. Yeah, what's the crack? Oh, you look very sharp. Uh, you know, I've, I've got to make an effort sometimes. Keep, I'm trying to keep up with you, you know. Listen, come here. You made your way over. Flight over. Early flight down from Birmingham. Uh, did you smooth a couple of uh, corporate tickets? <laughs> you did, didn't you? Uh, I'd be telling a lie if I said no. That's all I'm saying. Yeah, I, man I, man I managed to get a couple of uh, a decent seats today. A decent spec chair. So that's what I've managed to do. Um, I've got a decent spot. It's not too bad. And I'm looking forward to uh, to the day's racing. Yeah, so it's not too bad. Yeah, Bristol it was. I flew, I flew uh, into Bristol actually as well. Oh, did you? Uh, yeah. Come on, hit me with um, what's your bets of the day. It's a bit tougher today than, than yesterday, by all accounts. I'm yeah, a novice, as I you know. I think the word, the word, the word here is uh, terrible on the first, in the first, that's the one that I'll probably be back in the first race. I think under so is what they're all saying here, certainly. Uh, I think there's that one, the big hot pot, the double is, is under so and Lorena. That's, that's the big double for the day. And, uh, and it's Mal... Maldini in the last Maldini in the last race. That's the other one as well. That, that, that's where my be going today. Yeah. Yeah. Can you hear me? He was a good player, wasn't he? I wasn't bad. Yeah. Not as good as you, Keith, but he was <laughs> decent. Yeah. That, Maldini is one of the horses that's come up in my uh, tactic plan B yeah. today. So uh, that's definitely a, a good tip. I'll give you that advice on that one, Kev. Uh, the other one that uh, I'm looking at today is Bacardi's Each Way in the Stairs. What's your take on that horse? Uh, yeah, Bacardi's, uh, do you know what, I, honestly, Owen, every, every single person that I spoke to today here is literally just talking about the ground, so any of the, okay. the big favourites that they've that, that been thinking about here, I think Undersaw is one that certainly goes on the ground, I think what they're saying about Lorena goes on the ground, I think in the stage it's going to be a really, really difficult one to, you know, I, mean, I say a difficult one to predict, but I think the ground is affecting so many of the better horses, and I think that's what's going to go against so many of the 
of the of the big ones that we're actually looking at. Are you thinking of backing at, uh, backing coming here today? I think it changes your perception coming here when you're sp- certainly speaking to the, the guys that's around the track here today as well, telling you that telling you that look, the ground is is seriously bad, and you're looking for. I think today's a day for look to alternatives. It's very very small bets. Keep your powder dry. Fivers. Uh, two two fifties each way. That's all it's about, Keith. Don't go big. Don't go big, Owen. That's what it's about today. Kev, you go big. You go home today. That's the message I'm going to give you. No, well, well, do you know what it'll be? I'll be, get, I'll, I'll be keeping to that. I'll be keeping to that until I get to the third or fourth race. If I'm losing, then it's go big. Then I'll probably lose again. Then it'll be go even bigger. And that's how my day will probably go today. Yeah. So I'll end up either being maybe slightly up or maybe breaking even, or I'll be very much down. Yeah. <laughs> Um, just in terms of what happened yesterday, obviously uh, there was Ruby Walsh news, but also that Sam Crow win. Did you happen to have any money on that horse by any chance? Uh, that, that seems like a leading question, that Owen. Uh, actually, but you, I think you're not. Uh, I'd actually, yeah, I'd back, I backed Sam Crow quite a while, uh, quite a long time ago. I'd what price did you get, Kev? Uh, September, October. I got a decent price initially to win any race at uh, at five to one, six to one. I think it was actually got any race, and then I actually backed it at seven to two to win any race at Cheltenham. So. I was kind of covering me back on a couple of things here, really. So that, that's kind of how I did it. I think in general, um, I've done it. In, I've done it in a, in a couple of doubles here and there. So I, I managed to win a few quid, Owen. Yeah, on um, on Sam Crow yesterday. I backed Tiger Roll yesterday, so I managed to win a few quid. Hey, well, it's no uh, surprise you've gone well corporate today, then, is there? <laughs> <Huh>? <laughs> well, it's some, sometimes you've got it. You've got to spread the love. That's what it is, you know. Um, as, what, 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 what's the old saying? It's about it's about sharing the love, sharing the wealth. I think that's what it is. So that, that's what I'm trying to do. Give a little back. Listen, make sure you get yourself into the Guinness Village and have a couple for me, please. I've actually just been down there. I've had, I've had a couple of pints already down there, uh, <laughs> just in the last hour. So now I'm now I'm kind of relaxing now. I'm getting in so racing jealous. Balls. We'll see how it goes. So jealous. Listen, thanks for taking the time. I appreciate it. Have a good day, all right? All right, lads. Take it easy. Have a good day. See you, boys. See you, pal. So jealous. So jealous. So, so jealous. I seriously can't tell you how jealous I am. I know. More jealous, and you know how much I love New York, more jealous of that and you've been in New York last week. Yeah, well, I guess we weren't uh, Skyping you from New York, kind of showing you the... I've seen the crappy quiz. Oh, yeah. It was a very crappy quiz last week. It was very crappy, yeah. Wasn't it? The host in particular was terrible. Yeah. Uh, I was more jealous of Cheltenham last year. Why? Because of uh, the weather. Like, last oh, yeah. year was a scorcher, yeah. wasn't it? It was all these fancy drone shots going over the ground and everybody with the shades on yeah. and they couldn't jackets have the over drone the shoulder. Could they, with the wind? Yeah, exactly. You probably couldn't put a drone yeah. up there, yeah. So it's a bit of a mud fest, but I'd imagine that has little to no impact on the festivities going on over there. Ah, he's a lucky man, that Kevin Caban, lucky man. Right, we're going to get over now. I spoke to Alan Judge a little bit earlier in between his training session. He was in the gym uh, in between going out on the pitch. He took a little bit of time out. Here's what he had to say. Joining me on the line now is Alan Judge, my former Blackburn Rovers teammate, uh, playing for Brentford and just got his call up for, for Ireland. Alan, thanks for joining us. No problem. Nice to hear from you, Keith, again. Uh Right, talk to me. You're doing us a favour here. You've just come out of the gym, haven't you? In preparations, you're dodging in between uh, sessions at Brentford. Been in the gym, you got training later on. Yeah, um, just come, just doing my little bit extra, you know, for my leg before I get started, you know, just to keep the power up in there and get a lot more strength into it. Tell us a, fit now, you still have to do a lot of it. Tell us a little bit about it, um, the injury. Because if we, if we bring people back, it was April 2016. <laughs> to paint the picture, you were flying in the championship I think he scored 14 goals in 38 games there was talk of moves to Newcastle you just had your first cap for Ireland against Switzerland and then this horrendous leg break against um, Ipswich Town wasn't it how, how did that feel at the time and did, could you imagine that it would take you 20 months to get back from that uh, to, no to be honest with you as you said there, I was on top of the world at the time you know I'd done what I've always wanted to do I'd play for Ireland I'd come back with even more confidence going into the the two games before against Forest and I think it was Wigan playing playing great and then two minutes into the next game there you go tackle happens um, to be honest with you what, when it happened all I thought about was my family it was the strangest thing you just automatically think oh, my family I've got the two I have the two kids Jackson was only four months old at the time so obviously I was thinking everything about them I knew I knew it was broke the minute the tackle happened so it was just funny it was just a flash about my family straight away and it wasn't until, you know, two or three days later after I had the op and I realised how long I was going to be. And it's been a, it's been it's certainly been the most difficult period I would imagine in in your career. Tell tell us because look, you you'd have seen me maybe at Blackburn when yeah. I was out a long term, and you see mm. players in the in the gym. 
daily grind, I don't think you can really put yourself in that position and, and imagine what it's like until you're there, can you? No, and with the way it's work here, because obviously, as you know yourself, you've got the fifth players, they come first at the time. Not on purpose, but the way it is, you have to get the fifth players out and train. So I would come in, I would come in probably about quarter day, eight o'clock, do my own little stuff first. The lads would come in around quarter to nine. They would get ready. I would have breakfast while they're getting ready. They would go out to train. Then I would get my bit of treatment, and then they're coming in. I'm going to get lunch. I didn't see them. Yeah, you're, didn't see them for you're on nine, opposite timetables, aren't you? Everything. And I totally understand that. It's not the physio's fault. They need to be available for everybody, as you know yourself. So that was the difficult part, is that I didn't even see them. I didn't even see anybody for nine, ten months until I got back out on the pitch first time. But obviously it didn't feel 100% right. And then I went through that again. But lucky enough, after the second operation, it went quicker. I was out in the field quite quick. I was back around the lads fairly quick. Did you know straight away, so, er, second time around, that, that it was better? Uh, it was just it just, just felt right? Just uh, within six weeks of it, I was back walking. Uh, my wedding was coming up. So I made a beeline that no matter what, I was walking down that, you know, I was walking on the day of that wedding. And it just, it just felt so much better. You know, still took time. I had a good trip out to Philadelphia. I went and saw Bill Knowles, who was a specialist, and had a good two weeks there. Came back good, and I kicked on from there, really. From August on, I was out on the pitch. But obviously, I'm coming to now, I think it is. Well, we're in March. March. I'm yeah. still getting fit. How do you I'm feel? So you've, you've, been, you've come on in nine... Um Nine yeah. games for, for Brentford since the start of January. So they've obviously been easing you back in. How, how is the fitness at the moment? How's your sharpness? Uh, I, uh, physically, I feel good. I feel so much better. I'm actually a physically a better better condition than I was before I got injured, which you would expect after having nearly two years out. But, um, you know, there's nothing like starting a game. You know, I'm coming on. I'm getting 15 minutes here and there, 20 minutes. I know I can do 15, 20 minutes now. I'm looking for that taste of a start of a game to see where I can get to. Yeah. And and this isn't being smart or anything. The only person you have to ask is the manager why, you know, I'm I'm just waiting, I'm biding my time, I'm being patient, I'm not knocking on the door. So hopefully it'll come soon. Yeah, I'm sure it will. Look, in, in, in terms of knowing you the way I do, it's, 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 a, it's obviously great and actually in terms of you just want to play. You've always been that type of player. You've never been one to just stay at a certain club maybe because it's a bigger club you've always wanted in no. your career haven't you to, to get out and play games and play regularly exactly that's why I left Blackburn the second time you know I went back I got told I was playing the minute I knew I wasn't going to be playing straight off onto the play again I'm not one to sit around so but I understand I'm coming back from I am coming back from a major injury so um, yeah I just I just have to be patient which I feel I am I'm hopefully my chances just around the corner Tell me how big of an incentive. I remember reading something uh, about you trying to get back for the the, the October um, international games against Wales and then the playoff against Denmark. That obviously didn't happen. How big of an incentive then was it to try and get ready for these friendlies in March against Turkey? Uh, major, obviously. You, you don't want to be setting time limits on yourself but obviously you see things coming up and you're like I'm progressing well in training I'm doing well but obviously ultimately I wasn't there in October you know I was out on the pitch I was training I was doing everything but I just needed time everything just to kind of you know wake up again you know it's, it's not just your your leg that has to wake up it's all the other muscles in your body as well so um, but this is major you know when I saw my name get named in, in the provisional like I was I was surprised but you know it was great and um I'm Were you surprised, that yeah. cut. Just because of the lack of game time you've yeah. had, maybe? Probably, probably just be because of that. But I think I've shown I'm fit. I think the fears of people thinking, does he have a hangover from the injury? Obviously, I'm yet to start a game, but I think people just want to see me run around, and I think I've shown that. Obviously, I've had the, I've had the leg injury, but thank touch wood, I haven't had any little niggles yet. So... I I know you don't want to get too far ahead of yourself. I know yeah. you're talking about the, the game time, and 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 that that will undoubtedly come. There's not uh, there's no doubt in my mind certainly with, with your ability. In terms of this transitional period that we're having with the Irish team, certain players will retire. We've seen that the, the players that Martin's named in the provisional squad. Do you see this as a big opportunity to to stake a claim in that squad? Uh, yeah, yeah, I do. Uh, obviously, Wes is retired, and I them. Um not saying me and Wes are the same, but I think we're a bit of the same mould in that case that we do like to get on the ball, move around the pitch freely, 
and I'm just hoping um, I come in if I get if I get picked in the squad, I come in, show a bit and train that I'm all good and I'm all well. You know, pre-season in the summer is going to be massive for me. I'm not stupid to think that I'm going to just turn on like a light switch, light switch straight away. You know, I need a good pre-season behind me, and I've, I really think everybody will see the best of me again starting next season. Well, it was so, it's about building me up now. Yeah, and it was so cruelly to have already mentioned in terms of your first cap got that on top of the world the Euros were on the horizon. So during, I always felt when I was injured, I needed something to motivate me, no matter what that mm. was. It might have been a manager that maybe didn't fancy it, uh, an upcoming Ireland game, no matter what it was. But in terms of that being taken away from you, we've seen it with Wes. Uh, yeah. I didn't get my opportunity until my late 20s. So exactly. Martin knows your abilities. He's had you in the squad. He's named you in this one as soon as you're available. That must give you a lot of um, confidence. That when I seen that, that just gave me like um, a sudden uplift, you know, because obviously I haven't made a mistake here, but we seeing my name in that squad, and I'm thinking, Martin must like something about me. Gave me a great confidence. And when I've always gone with the Irish team, I've always really enjoyed doing the training there. You know, no one holds back. You have to show what you can do. So hopefully I'm looking forward to it again. As I said, this is probably the most frustrating time, frustrating time through the injury, because you're just, you're on the verge of everything, of you're coming on, but you want to start games. Mention Wes's retirement. I think that certainly opens up a gap in terms of an attacking midfield. I do think you're a little bit different, but I do think you're very different to what we have within that squad. And I think you can bring something maybe extra in certain areas of the pitch. Yeah, well, as I said, that's what I'm hoping. I think mostly where I've gone and played, I've had the freedom to roam around the pitch. You know, it suits me. It's, it's the best way for me. But obviously... You go in there, the manager wants you to play a certain way, that's fair enough, but you, I, I wouldn't want him to take away from my own game. You know, you look at James McLean, he's great at getting up and, down the, up and down the pitch and what he's done for us in the last year. So I would say I'm a bit different to him. As I said, I like to roam the pitch and hopefully get a few passes together. So everybody's different and hopefully I can bring my, my little bit to the team if, if selected. I'm sure you will, I've no doubt about it. Talk to me a little bit about the championship uh, you know I'm over most weekends. I'm a huge yeah. fan of the championship. You're 11 in the 11th in the table, eight points behind Middlesbrough, who you face on Saturday. Um, you, you lost against Cardiff on on Tuesday night. Um, I said it's it's still there, it's, it's going to be difficult, but I would imagine you are still focused on trying to just bridge that gap between yourselves and Middlesbrough in sixth. Yeah, I think this. This is the, probably one of the defining games this weekend. This is a big game, whether you stay in, in touch or not. I think uh, we have to win. You know, because um, I think Middlesbrough are six at the moment, are they? Uh, yeah, six, eight points. So uh, if, they, if they beat us, they pull away. That's 11 points, 10, whatever it is. We need to win. And that's the only thing in our mind. And the lads, uh, they'll, they'll be pretty focused on us, on, on trying to get the win on Saturday. It won't be easy because they've got a very good team. So uh, we'll be trying our best on Saturday. Who's, who's impressed you this season? We've seen Wolves for the vast majority of the season uh, play expansive, really good football to watch, individual brilliance. I know they've spent a lot of money. Um, and then we've seen, say, for instance, Cardiff, who are looking likely now to, to get that second automatic spot, who you faced during a, a real stark contrast in styles in terms of a real physical side. Who, who's impressed you this season? Well, obviously Wolves. Wolves, Wolves have impressed massively. I know they've spent a lot of money, but the players have gelled very, very quick. Which you, to be fair, you would expect with that quality, that quality that they brought in, you would expect that. But Cardiff the other night, you know, people say they don't play the best, best football. Well, I tell you one thing: they get the ball into the box and they know what they're doing when they get it in there. And then my favourite, and I, Brentford fans probably wouldn't want it, is Fulham. I knew you were going to say. I'm just watching. <laughs> I'm watching, watching Fulham at the minute. I just think they're going to pip second. Do you? Just with you the way they're playing football. Like. Pip, um, Pip Cardiff, or can you see Wolves maybe dropping out? No, I think Wolves have stayed. I just think something about Fulham with the way they're playing, you know, they got Tom Kearney right, uh, back at the right time and Mitrovic has come in and made a massive difference. And then Sawyers has gone there as well. And they've got a lot of attacking options, you know, and I think they play with us probably the best football in the league. Yeah. The Wolves. Look, I, I, I'm a big fan of them as well. I'm also a big fan of, of your team and I'm absolutely itching for you to, to get back in the team. As you know, listen, I really appreciate you taking the time. I'll be looking forward to seeing you hopefully get that second cap on the board uh, next week against Turkey. Thanks for taking the time, Alan. Fingers crossed. Appreciate that, Keith. Speak to you soon. 
absolute diamond the Vlad he was a young player young pro at Blackburn when I was there always had high hopes from his attitude was always impeccable um, his size probably went against him at times in terms of certain styles of play not suited to it uh, always wanted to go out and play was never content just being at a club being at a big club being at a Premier League club wanted to go and forge his career he's had to go drop down to come back up and I do think he will get an opportunity in a green shirt. That's a good sign that he doesn't settle for that mm. contentment of just being a Premier League player because to a certain extent you see it with championship teams once they get promoted there is kind of certain stagnation that's quite often it's not only the step up in standard why there's a complete overhaul sometimes mm. during the summer before your first season in the Premier League it's often because of the mentality around the club it's like we're at the top of the mountain mm. and now you're at the bottom of an even bigger mountain yeah. once you go up but um, like, what happened at the end of his Blackburn career? Well, why did, was it just not getting... Just wasn't getting, getting in. The th pathway wasn't there. I think he may be left under Sam Allardyce. So he's obviously not going to fit into that style of play. Um, I remember trying to get him to MK Dons when I wasn't there um, because I rated him that highly. I felt it would sue his game as well. He's a number. His best position for me is as a number 10. And he's an energetic type of number 10. He will run in beyond. He... That's what I mentioned. He was, he's very different to Wes Hulan and the way he plays. He's infectious. He's the first one to go and close down. He's just a bundle of energy and he links up play really, really well. So you're like that. That was actually what I was just going to ask about, like the, the comparisons with Wes, because mm. everybody's kind of now looking for this new spark. They're very it's, different. It, very, very different. It, Wes has more guile to his game and in terms of that vision. Alan's more explosive. Yeah. He covers every single blade of grass, whereas Wes. You know, he's more mercurial. He would he'd find those little pockets of space and look, get his head up and look for those passes. Alan George will run in beyond. He will link up play very well. He will get it and he will give it. And he was he's 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 full on. It seems to me that he would be able to survive and be kind of a, a fixture of a Martin O'Neill team uh, a lot more than Wes Hulin was, and potentially without the ball as well. That's a key part of his yeah. game. They're closing down. The, or, uh, like this is a big comparison to make but the Bobby Firmino type of without mm. the ball play uh, albeit in a number 10 role um, but obviously like to, everybody's rooting for him kind of more exactly. so after that injury especially 20 months out long yeah. time showed a lot of bottles to get back for so we genuinely wish him um, the best of luck with a little comment in uh, from Kieran O'Donoghue heading to Antalya this day we hope to see Alan get a good run over there best of luck Alan great player totally agree so hopefully he um he gets an opportunity next week. Uh, good to see him back. Right, let's move on now. We'll chat a little bit about championship. I know you're a big fan, on Huge fan. You're a big fan. Wolves have been going through a little bit of a hiccup. There's no doubt about that. Um, I was at the game last week when they played Villa. Really struggled second half. But in terms of coming back and bouncing back well, they played Reading on Tuesday night. Villa went the other way, lost at home to QPR. You would imagine that top two is set in stone now and you've got two really contrasting styles Wolves open expansive style play three at the back Matt Doherty as a wing back one side Douglas on the other Matt Doherty got two goals the other night as well yeah. and did he get an assist no he didn't get an assist he should he should have had an assist Benny Cafalby missed one so he'll be coming into this Ireland squad full of confidence no as question. well um, Cardiff Neil Warnock seven promotions been there done it all the rest so different. You heard Alan Jules talk about it. They get the ball in the box every single opportunity. They are so effective at what they do. It is frightening. I think they've won seven on the bounce now. And other teams have, have had a little bit of a wobble up. Them, Fulham and Villa up until Tuesday night at home to QPR have been flying but just not quite enough to catch Wolves, who had that 15-point gap going back to January. Yeah, you look at the seven-point gap between Cardiff and Aston Villa, it's mm. not a nine games left in the season, so still plenty of opportunity Football. for Cardiff to mess it up. Mm. If I'm running Cardiff City right now, you get promoted, sack Warnock. Do a Watford on it. Just sign the new deal. Doesn't matter, sack him. Doesn't matter. You're, you're going to get the big TV money. Mm. What, will, what will Neil Warnock achieve for you? Maybe, by the skin of your teeth, survive relegation. Mm. You're probably going to sack Neil Warnock in November anyway. <laughs> so you may as well you may as well sack him now. Once you get promoted, sack Neil Warnock. You're Just a be harsh done with man. Him. Just be done with him. Like, what have you seen from him in the Premier League that it's like, other than maybe, did he survive one year, two years in, with Sheffield United? Mm, if even not sure I can't recall yeah, but his like, record isn't great in it the ended Premier in League. tears eventually yeah. but uh, just on the Wolves point like obviously 
this uh, attacking style that they have is mm. so good to watch and it's something that will probably hold their own with a little bit more pragmatism in the Premier League but it's what's going on behind the scenes mm. like it's very easy to just kind of uh, talk about agents now and, and associate players with agents and that's why certain players are moving to certain clubs but there's a lot of other stuff happening in football today with regards to players behind the scenes, big political movers and stuff like mm. that. And it seems that the hierarchy in Wolves are very well connected. That if they want to make a move happen, within reason, yeah. they will make that happen. Well, they it's will jealousy, be... isn't it, in terms of yeah. the other teams? And it's only come out now because of where Wolves have found themselves. Top of the league, looking very likely to go to the Premier League. And you're right, they have utilised those connections very, very well. Are they paying market value for these players, the likes of Ruben Neves, Diego Jota? Bonatini, who they've brought in on loan. Jotas is now a permanent deal. They made that permanent in January. Probably not. Is there player ownership issues going on? Who knows? Mm. But they've utilised well. But it's not as if it hasn't gone on previously. And just briefly on the running of a football club. And when I go and analyse games, so for instance, Brentford against Cardiff the other night. Cardiff portrayed that they don't pay big money. They, don't, they just bought Gary Medine in January for six million quid. Gary Medine before this season had scored nine championship goals in his career and I think he's 27 years of age they have got money they do spend money there's players there on big big wages Brentford such a well run football club they run it on a bit of a formula in terms of the recruitment there's a lot of statistics involved in how they recruit players but the wage structure is very much in place the style of play has remained even though there's a managerial change um, Dean Smith has been there now probably a couple of years signed the new contract very very well run club and for them and, and it, the achievement is top half yeah. that's a massive achievement for a club like Brentford so there's so many different clubs in the championship that are running different ways I find it a fascinating league I really do it is I, I guess with Brentford though is the upshot a little bit smaller than Wolves you can make incremental gains and as long as there's patience from the fans mm. you can then move your way up into the playoff spots and then into the promotion playoffs because like, they've had top half finishes before and ultimately it hasn't been this quantum leap that some would expect mm. from you know the FC Micheland model which is obviously employed mm. in Brentford so it's an interesting one but it's, it's always a crazy one in terms of the narratives of the season that everybody was hyped about Wolves from the first month of the season and it's always inevitable that there's a collapse involved mm. in the championship but they haven't collapsed too dramatically they've gone through bad spells yeah. and then you look at the other element of that particularly when it comes to the playoffs, anybody who makes a late surge and kind of get that whatever uh, third or fourth goal. seed and yeah. end up bringing that momentum in, like Preston could be a candidate for that. I know it's a long shot now, but they've got Johnny Maguire back. I mean, there, there's certain elements of momentum mm. coming back there and if they were managed, if they managed to sneak a sixth spot in the championship, I mean, that would be some story. That would. I think they're on the... The, the only team that are slightly out of sorts at the moment are Derby County. Mm. Middlesbrough are on a bit of a surge with Tony Pulis. Fulham are flying and Villa doing well. I know they slipped up the other night. I think it'll finish as it is in yeah. terms of the playoffs as is. I don't think there will be that team coming from nowhere that we've seen maybe in certain years gone by to ghost into the playoffs, full of momentum, full of confidence and fly. Like, let's say if it's now, Villa against Middlesbrough, Fulham against Derby, they're two cracking mm. encounters for the playoff semi-finals. Like, the division is obviously getting better and better because the Premier League is getting better it's and better. It's just a knock-on effect. It's it, Premier it, League too. Feed. It is, yeah. So, it's it's an amazing thing. And, like, I, I think this is the... It's, it's almost like a baseball or the NBA mm. season where it's like the end of the year is when you want to start following the championship, get to mm. know these teams a little bit more before the playoffs because it's a great series. We've got um, Chris Hewton on Off the Ball tonight with Nathan uh, Murphy. He plays Manchester United in the FA Cup quarterfinals at the weekend. What a job he has done. Yeah. At Brighton, seriously, so impressive. Just gets about his work. Uh, it's a club that I have got a soft spot for. I really do. Spent the year on loan there. Got a lot of time for the people at the football club, and he very much echoes the people that run the club. Nothing flash about it. Just gets on with his work. The recruitment is good, and the fact that they've got themselves away from that bottom tree when at one stage it was looking a little bit perilous. Full credit to him. Absolutely, and also the dignity with which he mm. carries himself, and particularly the amount of interviews he's done for us, and I'm sure uh, every single time he comes on he's almost quizzed about certain elements of his career where mm. he simply he got screwed over a couple of times in his career, and the dignity with which he kind of doesn't talk about that or gives a very humble response and is like, that's football, and gets on with his mm. life and his career and puts things into perspective is incredibly impressive. He's the guy you root for the most in the Premier League. Yeah. Any neutral, I can't... Like, and it's not, it's not even just to do with the Irish angle. 
it is just any neutral in the Premier League. It's like Chris Hutton is a man mm. you can definitely stand behind. Like him and Sean Dyche really are probably the two yeah. neutral favourites, yeah. and maybe Eddie Howe to a certain level. So it's great. No. Like Manchester United, you would say they're there for the taking, but Jose Mourinho has really pinned his colours to the masts mm. now after uh, after his post match interview on BT when he's like, "Well, Liverpool don't have the FA Cup, and we do." Which is like a parody of nonsense. a quote. So nonsense. they're going to have to be Brighton at the weekend. Yeah. Um, we're going to move on now, we're going to chat rugby as Ireland's head into trying to slam home the Grand Slam on Saturday at Twickenham. Joining us on the line is my old school teammate, James Downey. James, thanks for taking the time. No problem, Keith. How are you? I'm good, pal. I'm good. You're with Owen as well. Right, we need to start with a certain Mr. Eddie Jones's comments. Now, I was infuriated by this, and I don't play rugby. I'm thinking of Gareth Selke coming out like that and saying something, and I'm playing England on Saturday. How will, how will have that gone down amongst the uh, the rugby lads? Look, I think it's going to be one of those scenarios where, uh, look, you know what Eddie Jones is like. He's extremely frustrating individual, isn't he? Um, it's nearly the team talk to a certain degree. I don't think they're going to focus on it too much. Um, they'd be too professional for that, I guess. But... Look, it's 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 gonna it's gotta hurt when you say when he comes out with ridiculous comments like that. I just the guy grates me completely. Um, I do think he's a good coach, but as a person, sometimes uh, when people say these things, it's uh, it's kind of ridiculous, isn't it, in this day and age? But it's the type of person he is. So it's a small thing, it's a side thing, and again, is it another deflection for him to take stuff off his players? Um, he's very good at the smoke screens, um, but I don't. I think it's only a small little thing for the players, to be honest. Because um, once they're out in the field, uh, they're going to have to switch off and and do the job at hand. It's it's more him distracting and deflecting. I think uh, the team has just been announced. The England team, seven changes. In come two of your former teammates, Elliot Daly and Dylan Hartley, comes back into captain the sides. What what will Elliot Daly bring to this England team? Um, is, uh, I presume Elliot's got on the wing there, has he? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, look, Elliot's a class player. I think. I think. Um, I was kind of hoping he'd be out. Um, Dylan, not so much. I didn't think he'd have too much of an impact because I actually think Jamie George is playing extremely well. Um, but Elliot brings in that different firepower. He's got that big, long range left boot as well, and I think that um, any penalties conceded that. Look, this game is going to be very small margins. So any small penalties that it, that they can go for, I think that Elliot Daly is a, a person who can actually step up and boot. But he's got an eye for a gap. He's one of these players who you want to get the ball in the hands. He had a great lines tour as well. So uh, he's he's been unlucky with injuries this year at Wasps, and I'm sure he'll be he'll be flying, looking forward to getting on the field. One of the big talking points from the team, James, is that uh, Owen Farrell is back at ten, and I guess it was kind of making ends meet to a certain extent with him being pushed out to twelve so far over the last year or so. Like, how big I- I- a difference is it from open play that Farrell is now playing in the ten role? Well, I think, firstly, I think you kind of look at the way George Forbes plays when when he struggles with with front football. Um, England don't look good as they did against France. Um, and I think that Farrell in there controls it. He can be physical if he has to. He can carry if he has to. I think it's a better balanced side with Farrell at 10. If you've got Farrell 10, I'm presuming that's Ben Teo and uh, Jonathan Joseph, yeah. which is a really good balance actually to the midfield. Um, and that's what I was hoping they'd put, well, not hoping, but I thought they'd go for. Um, but Farrell just controls everything really, doesn't he? Um, they do normally play with their two first receivers, but I still think that um, Farrell overall is, is a way better player and he's going to get his hands in the ball nice and early um, and he's going to keep that Irish defence honest but for me he controls things a lot better than George does and, and just adds a little bit more a little more bite to him and I think it's going to it's going to be a very physical game and I think that it's not one for, for Ford Moving on to the Ireland team I think it's due in the next 20 minutes or so what are you anticipating in terms of the changes that maybe Joe Schmidt might make and in particular the second row? Um, honestly, I don't think he's going to make a change. Um, I think the impact that Henderson had uh, was good as well. I, I think he'll stick with Devon in there. Um, and I think that James Ryan's playing out of the skin at the moment. And he's certainly been one of the form forwards. But um, I reckon he, I don't think he's going to change the team at all from the last day, if I'm honest. Um, I think Jordy Murphy did enough as well from the bench. Um, maybe the only interesting or call it be Jordan Larmer. Um, how confident are people in, in throwing him in there? If if Rob Carney goes down after five minutes in, in the cauldron that Twickenham's going to be at the weekend. Um, but it was interesting he played full back there at the weekend or got five minutes, ten minutes. Um, but that'll be the the only kind of contentious thing. But I still think he's going to stick with Larmer. And going back to the second rows, very happy with uh, with Devon and uh, with James Ryan. And again, how bad is it to have Ian Anderson coming on uh, off the bench? 
What would Joe have been working on mostly this week, do you think, in the build-up to this game and his coaching staff? Would the line-outs be one area of concern? Um, to be honest, I think look, most of the work is done now. I guess if you're just looking ahead to how we're going to target the English, uh, it's got to be breakdown. That's got to be a key area. Um, okay, line-out, yeah, of course, you've got to win your own set-piece ball, but for me, it's, it, it's at the breakdown. Um, the English get very frustrated. Even Sam Simmons came out and spoke about how frustrated he was with um, the breakdown and the, the team are getting that way so I think uh, Ireland will really put the right numbers in there uh, coming on this weekend How impressed have you been with Ireland in midfield this year like you know yourself in terms of playing with different midfield partners like it's obviously a very difficult thing to do and we're on to like, like we've gone through several different midfield partners and each one seems to have a level of cohesion that is very rare to see in a brand new midfield partnership yeah, it's it, it can be quite frustrating for people because you kind of get to learn how one person plays. Um, like it, it's going to be very interesting as well when when they're all fit and who you have to choose at that stage. And I think uh, if I'm looking down the line, I, I'd nearly go for the the Leinster triumphant of Sexton, uh, Henshaw, and Ringrose just because of that cohesion that they have together. But but in looking at this game, I think they've gone extremely well. Um, the players that have stepped in, very impressed. Um, Gary Ringrose is as I say, seamless. And Bundy Aki got credits due to Bundy as well. They all know their jobs. And look, it's just at that international level where um, standards are so high and they just can react on instinct. And look, they've been in camp long enough now and they would have had different training partners. So um, it's an impressive uh, impressive outfit that we've gotten. And look, everyone's talked about this, the strength and depth we've had and, and no better place than midfield. Uh, looking at, forward to it, like you've mentioned, uh, the Leinster triumvirate of potentially being Joe Schmidt's favourite 10, 12, 13 combination in the future. But does Bundy Aki just give us something different when it comes to actually getting involved at Rooks? I mean, I'm sure that's a nightmare for a midfielder to have to get involved in that, but Aki seems to be more than willing to do that work. Yeah, he's one of these lads. He, he kind of does the grunt work, doesn't he? He does all the, all the hard yards pretty easy, um, gets involved. Um, I think coming into this weekend, it's a perfect game for him, to be honest. Um, he's an aggressive, abrasive type and the English are going to have to watch him carefully and I think that they've nearly played Ben Teo to kind of uh, negate his impact on the game I think they might try and cancel each other out um, but again, he's put a powerful midfielder in to deal, to deal with Bundy but again, I think that aggressiveness uh, as I say, that abrasiveness that he brings into the into Carrion and into the Rook area is going to be certainly a key factor this weekend yeah? James, give us a final finally prediction what you think, how do you think it's going to pan out key battles and can we do it? Um, it's, it's going to be tight. It's like, you know, certainly earned uh, the Grand Slam to beat Fr the French and the English away. Um, English team uh, hasn't been since Woodward Zero since they've lost three in a row. It's going to be close. It's going to be tight. It's going to be a one score game, I reckon. Look, it's a game of small margins. Um, I think Ireland will nick it, though, just temperament, um, just the way that Joe's done this team. I think as well, looking forward, if we. If we want to win on foreign soil and go into a World Cup, we need to win these games. I think we will, just about. Key battles. Um, I think the 10 slot's huge. Um, and I know it's an easy one to go for the 10s, but I think if Johnny's on form in his boots, it's going to be a one-score game. So hopefully he can get in there and, uh, and nick it. I sincerely hope you're right. James, thanks for joining us. Appreciate your time. Cheers, guys. Cheers, keep Cheers on. <sighs> Big game. Yeah. Big game. You'll be watching? Well, without question. Um... The interesting thing that he said there is like it's just worth remembering what year it is, that it's one of the even number of years. And even if you said back in 2009, what year do you reckon Ireland will next do a Grand Slam? It could be 2018. I would say no chance. There's no way we're going to do it in an even number year because of mm. the trips to Paris and the trips to London. Uh, so it would be an amazing way to do it. Mm. Especially, like I know, I think the Eddie Jones comments are clearly people are getting, some people are getting a little bit too wound up about them. They're fairly harmless, but even before the comments uh, yesterday that came to light yesterday from last year, there is still just a general kind of level of, I would love to see you suffer another defeat to the scummy Irish. So <laughs> that would just add another layer to it that would just be so blissful and it would be so great. And I think expectations are very high. Like, obviously the championship's in the bag, but mm. what is the reaction going to be? Should we lose in Twickenham? I think there'll kind of be an air of post-Argentina 2015. Maybe not that bad, but certainly an element of... 
right, okay, we, we, like obviously in 2015 there was that unbelievable win against France in the pool stages and everybody was so hyped about that and then after Argentina the whole national mood soured considerably. Mm. I don't think it'll get to that level as I say but be prepared for a bit of a backlash should, should Ireland fail to do it which is unfair because they won the championship. Mm, exactly, look, it's, what time is it? It's literally gone half one. The first race has just gone off the JLT novices chase at Cheltenham. I need your nap of the day before we leave it. Oh, nap of the day uh, for me. <laughs> scrambling to <laughs> scrambling the papers, uh, Who am I going for nap of the day? I am going for under so as my nap of the day. What race is that in? That is in the 250. That is the Ryanair. Was that a John Duggan tip? It was. Uh, he... It's John Duggan's, isn't it? It's not yours. Well, I, I wouldn't dare Something. give tips that are my, my own original <laughs> tips. I would pick it on name or number if that were the uh, case. John, it's been an pr- absolute pleasure I've had a great time thank you for having thank me we'll be back again in a few weeks absolutely and this time next year at Cheltenham Golden you're Ticket in, you're, a top, you're top of the list yeah top thank you very list. much thanks for joining us if you missed anything you can download it the off the ball website we'll be back as per usual at half 12 next week good luck